first time I have a book fair. Okay, so good afternoon again, everyone, and welcome to the 32nd anniversary of the Miami Book Fair. I'm Crystal Lewis. I'm one of the volunteer room hosts here at the fair, and we're delighted to have you here with us this afternoon. If you've looked through, and I'm sure you have throughout the day through the schedule of events, you'll see there are um, many venues of author sessions running today as well as tomorrow, plus activities in Children's Alley and programs in the swamp and the porch and a lot more. So in essence, there's a lot of exciting things happening here at the book fair. Please consider becoming a member of the Friends of the Book Fair. Your charitable contribution will support this wonderful book fair and friends receive multiple benefits such as preferential seating and admission to special book fair events. Pretty cool. We greatly appreciate all of our friends. And this year, you supporting the fair is easier than ever. You can text BOOK to 501-501 to donate $10. You will receive a text back asking to confirm your donation, and you simply need to reply yes. We are also grateful to our sponsors, including the Knight Foundation, OHL Arellano, and the Bachelor Foundation, and so many more that are listed on signage and materials throughout the fair. Miami Book Fair certainly does not end today, and it also does not end tomorrow. Miami Book Fair programs, events, and activities take place throughout the year here and all over Miami. We are grateful to Miami-Dade College and the hundreds of volunteers that make it all possible. Thank you, volunteers. Um, oh, thank you to our wonderful volunteers. There will be a brief question and answer after the reading, and the authors will be autographing books immediately after the session. And the autographing section is just outside of these double doors here to your right you'll be directed that way as well. Now I'd like to kindly ask that you silence your cell phones and any other electronic devices. Hopefully you've gotten in all of those selfies and hashtag Miami Reads, right? So that we will not have any interruptions. And here to introduce our special guest authors is another very special guest for us, Judge Robert Luck. Please join me. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. My name is Robert Luck. I am a judge here in Miami-Dade County, and I want to tell you how thrilled I am to introduce this session. If you're a fan of history, if you're a fan of the Civil War, if you like biography, this is the place to be. And I was uh, truly honored to be asked to introduce uh, the four amazing folks that we have here today. Uh, first, um, not necessarily in order, it's, uh, we have James uh, L. Swanson. Uh, James L. Swanson is the Edgar Award-winning New York Times best-selling author of Manhunt the 12 day chase for Lincoln's killer. In Newsweek magazine, author Patricia Cronwell named Truman Capote's In Cold Blood and Swanson's Manhunt as the two greatest nonfiction crime books ever written. His other books include Bloody Crimes and The End of Days, The Assassination of John F. Kennedy. He also wrote the award-winning young adult bestsellers Chasing Lincoln's Killer and The President Has Been Shot, The Assassination of John F. Kennedy. He serves on the advisory councils of the Ford's Theater Society and the Gettysburg Foundation. He has a degree in history from the University of Chicago and one in law from UCLA. He has served in a number of government and think tank posts in Washington, D.C., including working at one of my former places of employment, the United States Department of Justice. And for each of the authors, I, I did a little bit of research in addition to the materials given to me. Um, so I'll give a little personal fact about each author that they didn't know I'd say. For Mr. Swanson, um, you can understand his uh, fascination with uh, Abraham Lincoln. He was born on the same day that Mr. Lincoln was born. Not the same year, of course, but the same day. <laughs> uh, professor Martha Hodes um, is a professor of history at New York University and has taught as a Fulbright scholar in Germany and as a visiting professor at Princeton University. She is the author of The Sea Captain's Wife, A True Story of Love, Race, and War in the 19th Century, and was a finalist, which was a finalist for the Lincoln Book Prize, and White Women, Black Men, Illicit Sex in the 19th Century South, winner of the Alan Nevis Prize for Literary Distinction in the Writing of History. 
In her latest work, uh, latest work of nonfiction, Morning Lincoln, which was a long list selection for the 2015 National Book Award, Hodes captures the full range of reactions to the president's assassination, far more divisive, uh, far more diverse and divisive than public expressions would suggest, telling a story of shock, glee, sorrow, anger, blame, and fear. Karen Arabin. Karen Arabin. Uh, she has been called by USA Today the pioneer of sizzle history. Uh, tells the spellbinding story of four women who risked everything to become spies during the Civil War in liar, temptress, soldier, spy. Four women undercover in the Civil War. Using a wealth of primary source material and interviews with the spies' descendants, Abbott seamlessly weaves the adventures of these four heroines throughout the tumultuous years of the war. Her book, The Liar, Temptress, Soldier, Spy, was a best book of 2004 listed by Library Journal, by uh, Christian Science Monitor, by Amazon, and uh, for those of you who like the TV or television version, it's been optioned by Sony as a miniseries. Um, Abbott's previous books, uh, Sin and the Second City and American Rose, were New York Times bestsellers. Um, about Miss Abbott, um, I read an interview that she gave recently with Philadelphia Weekly, where she used to write, where she said that as a kid she wanted to be a rapper for the group Salt and Pepper. Um, I, I forgot mine about Ms. Hodes. Uh, Ms. Hodes has a, a very long uh, resume, 28 pages I counted, um, but the nugget that I got there was that she was a script consultant for the PBS series History Detectives, which I had watched. Um, and finally, Mr. Stiles, T.J. Stiles, is the author of The First Tycoon, The Epic Life of Cornelius Vanderbilt, winner of the 2009 National Book Award in Nonfiction and the 2010 Pulitzer Prize in Biography, and Jesse James, Last Rebel of the Civil War. He is a member of the Society of American Historians and a former Guggenheim Fellow. In his new book, Custer's Trials, A Life on the Frontier of a New America, Stiles paints a portrait of Custer both deeply personal and sweeping in scope, proving how much of Custer's legacy has been ignored, revealing a volatile, contradictory person. During Custer's lifetime, Americans saw their world remade. Intimate, dramatic, and provocative, this biography captures the larger story of the changing nation in Custer's tumultuous marriage to his highly educated wife, Libby, their complicated relationship with Eliza Brown, the forceful black woman who ran their household, as well as his battles and expeditions. It casts surprising new light on a near-mythic American figure, a man both widely known and little understood. And Mr. Stiles, in addition to doing all of that, um, teaches and practices Japanese Shotokan Karate Do and is a fifth degree black belt. Thank you. Uh, welcome all. Uh, thank you all so much for coming here. Um, and uh, sorry, my slideshow sort of disappeared for a second. Um, I think we should all be very grateful that I'm not rapping. Um, <laughs> Sorry, here we go. Uh, this is a temperamental, just like the, the spies. Uh, here we go. Uh, anyway, I'm going to just jump right in and just talk about how I became interested in this book very quickly. Um, I was born and raised in Philadelphia, uh, but moved to Atlanta in 2001, where I lived for six years, and realized that uh, the Civil War seeps into daily life and conversation down south in a way it never does up north. Uh, you know, there's all these jokes about the War of Northern Aggression and the occasional Confederate flag on the lawn. Um, and this point was really driven home for me one day when I was stuck in traffic on Route 400, which is Atlanta's most uh, uh, treacherous thoroughfare, for two hours behind a bumper sticker um, that read, Don't blame me, I voted for Jeff Davis, <laughs> uh, who, of course, was the president of the Confederacy. Uh, and I stuck behind this uh, bumper sticker for two hours and had quite a bit of time to really start thinking about the Civil War. My mind always goes to, well, what, what were the women doing? Um, not just any women, what were the bad women doing? What were the defiant women doing? And I was determined to find four women um, who you know, went a little bit further than most. Uh, I wanted to find four women um, who, <laughs> who uh, sort of lied, stealed, wheedled, plundered, uh, avenged, drank, stole, and murdered their way through the war. And I'm pretty confident I found that. I'm just going to uh, jump in and uh, introduce you to the four female Civil War spies um, that I uh, spent a lot of time with in the writing of this book. This is my first one. This is Belle Boyd. Um, she was a 17-year-old girl living in the Shenandoah Valley, Virginia, when the war broke out. And I loved Belle. Um, she was all id. You know, she had no filter, especially when she was talking about herself. 
Uh, and just to give you a little glimpse of her personality, um, here's a brief excerpt of a letter she wrote to her cousin right before the war broke out in which she is lobbying him to find her a husband. So this is Belle Boyd. I am tall, she wrote. I weigh 106 and a half pounds. My form is beautiful. My eyes are of a dark blue and so expressive. My hair of a rich brown and I think I tie it up nicely. My neck and arms are beautiful and my foot is perfect. <laughs> Only wear size two and a half shoes. My teeth the same pearly whiteness, I think perhaps a little whiter. Nose quite as large as ever, neither Grecian nor Roman, but beautifully shaped. And indeed, I am decidedly the most beautiful of all of your cousins. Um, so Belle clearly had no problems with self-esteem. Um, and she, she was sort of, I like to say that if, if Sarah Palin and Miley Cyrus had a 19th century baby, um, it would have been Belle Boyd. Uh, she was very in, overt with both her opinions and her sexuality, especially for a young girl during this time period. And she kicks things off in July of 1861. Uh, Union forces had just won a small skirmish and they're marching up the Shenandoah Valley to Bell's hometown of Martinsburg, Virginia. Um, it's Martinsburg, West Virginia today, but back then it was still Martinsburg, Virginia. Um, and they are planning on having a big 4th of July victory parade in Martinsburg. And they arrive there and they start uh, you know, stealing liquor and looting, store, looting stores and ransacking homes and terrorizing the residents. And Bell's waiting them for them to show up at her house. And she's waiting for them with a pistol by her side. Um, so sure enough, they come to Belle's home. Uh, one of the men threatens to raise a Union flag over her home. And Belle, uh, being the cool, calm, and collected sort that she was, decides to shoot this fellow dead. And she shoots him and gets away with it. Uh, and she's very emboldened by the fact that she gets away with it. And she decides that the Confederate Army needs her. Um, in order for them to have any chance, they need her services. Um, so she uses her family connections. She had several family friends um, and relatives in, this, in the Confederate Army. And she uses them to get a sort of position as a low-level spy um, and courier and sort of a deliverer of messages. Uh, here's Belle taking herself very seriously in this role. Um, and, and she was a notorious seductress. Uh, that's how she started, started cultivating um, and getting information. Um, she did not discriminate. She went after Union men, Confederate men. Um, and I, I, you know, uh, Union General James Shields, according to one Northern reporter, was closeted for four hours with Bell, um, and she celebrated this conquest by wrapping a rebel flag around his head. Um, one of her other conquests, and this is why I love nonfiction, these are things you cannot make up, uh, one of her other conquests uh, was a man by the name of Major Dick Long. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I always feel like a 12-year-old boy telling that anecdote, but I found that in a newspaper clip somewhere and just decided I had to put it in. Um, but anyway, Belle, uh, Belle was obsessed with uh, winning the war. She was uh, devoted to the Confederacy, um, and she would go on to have many interesting adventures, uh, and I'll get into a few of those. This is my second spy. This is Private Frank Thompson. Uh, and Private Frank Thompson came into the war with a bit of a secret. Uh, Private Frank Thompson was actually a woman named Emma Edmonds and had been living as a man for two years. Um, and uh, Frank Thompson had a very interesting background, Emma Edmonds. Uh, grew up in Canada, uh, was raised by a very strict father um, who wanted to marry her off to a neighboring uh, a farmer in the neighborhood. Um, she had seen what this sort of arranged marriage had done to all of her older sisters. And she was determined to have a more of an exciting life for herself. Uh, she wanted some adventure. Uh, so one day when she was about 17 years old, she cut her hair, she bound her breasts, and she traded in her men's, uh, excuse me, her women's dress for a men's suit and began living as Frank Thompson. And she migrated to the United States where she worked as an itinerant Bible salesman. And she began hearing about uh, the abolitionist John Brown and the drumbeat of events leading up to the Civil War. And she decided she wanted a piece of that action. Uh, in the spring of 1861, she's in uh, Detroit, Michigan, and she decides to enlist with the 2nd Michigan. And I did a lot of research to figure out how Emma Edmonds, um, along with about approximately 400 other women who disguised themselves for both North or South and, and enlisted with the armies, you know, how did they get away with this? Um, and I came to the conclusion, you know, there were several things that, that aided them in their disguise, but I came to the conclusion that the reason uh, they most got away with it, the, the, the uh, most um, compelling reason, was that uh, nobody knew what a woman would look like wearing pants. You know, people were so used to seeing women's bodies pushed and pulled in these exaggerated shapes with corsets and crinolines 
uh, that the very idea of a woman wearing pants, uh, let alone an entire arm uniform, was so unfathomable that they just couldn't see it. Um, so Emma took great advantage of this, um, and was, everything was going on rather swimmingly for her until she very unexpectedly fell in love uh, with a fellow Union soldier, uh, another member of the 2nd Michigan, uh, this ra rather dashing gentleman by the name of uh, Jerome Robbins. And one of the great uh, joys of researching this book was being at the University of Michigan and finding Jerome Robbins' diary, in which he makes several mentions about his friend Frank Thompson. Um, and they're always something like, there's something funny about my friend Frank Thompson. <laughs> I can't quite put my finger on it, uh, but a mystery seems to be connected to him. Um, and so uh, it was one of my favorite storylines of the book to follow, you know, their relationship. And was Emma, you know, was Emma going to admit to him who and what she was and let the chips fall where they may? Or was she going to keep her secret to herself and just try to play it safe? Uh, so that's something I, I uh, explore in the book. This is my third spy. This is uh, Confederate spy Rose O'Neill Greenhow. Uh, she's pictured here with her eight-year-old daughter, little Rose. Um, and Rose was in an interesting predicament uh, when the war broke out. Um, her whole life had fallen apart in the years leading up to the war. She had lost five children in four years, if you can imagine that. She had lost her husband in a freak accident. And she had lost her access to the White House. Um, this is somebody who had been friends with high-ranking Democratic politicians for years leading up to the war. Um, she had even been a very close advisor and confidant to former President James Buchanan. And she lost all of that um, when Lincoln and the Republicans came into power. And she was really desperate to get a whole a piece of her old life back and to salvage what was left of it. Uh, so in the spring of 1861, when a Confederate captain approached Rose and asked her if she would organize and run a Confederate espionage ring in Washington, D.C., in the federal capital, um, Rose jumped at the chance. Um, she was also a notorious seductress. Um, and she uh, began cultivating sources. And by cultivating, I mean seducing. Uh, one of her reported paramours was this gentleman. Um, this is uh, Senator Henry Wilson of Massachusetts, uh, who was not only an abolitionist Republican, but also Lincoln's uh, chairman of the Committee on Military Affairs. Uh, so you can imagine they had some quite interesting and lucrative pillow talk uh, that Rose would use to her advantage. Uh, this was one of my favorite finds in the National Archives. Uh, this was Rose O'Neill Greenhouse cipher um, that was given to her by her uh, Confederate uh, captain. And she spent hours uh, studying this cipher, memorizing the symbols, practicing writing it so that she would be able to communicate with her Confederate sources and the generals. Um, if you look down on the lower left, uh, I don't know if you can see it from there, but there's the symbol for Lincoln. Uh, it's a, it looks like an inverted triangle bisected by a slash. Um, Rose had two nicknames for Lincoln. One was Beanpole and the other was Satan. <laughs> uh, just to give you an idea of the level of her animosity uh, for the president. Um, and she spent hours memorizing the cipher, um, but when the occasions arose that she did not have time to encrypt her, her messages, she devised other means that she can communicate with her Confederate scouts. Um, she called them scouts. They were technically not scouts, but that's what she called them. Um, she, for example, memorized the Morse code. Um, and at a certain appointed hour, um, somebody might be watching her windows, and she would raise and lower her blinds according to the dots and dashes of the Morse code. Um, and she could achieve the very same effect if she was on the street uh, by precisely fluttering her fan according to the dots and dashes of the Morse code. So some pretty ingenious spycraft by Rose, um, which she used to some uh, great effect early on in the war. This is my fourth spy. This is Elizabeth Van Lu. Uh, who was sort of the exact opposite of Rose O'Neill Greenhow. Um, she was a Union spy living in the Confederate capital of Richmond, so switch there. And whereas Rose was uh, brazen and outspoken, um, Elizabeth was quiet and cautious and discreetly cunning. And whereas everybody always raved about Rose's beauty, um, Elizabeth, according to one of her neighbors, was, quote, never as pretty as her portrait showed. <laughs> Rear. <laughs> Um, yeah, poor Elizabeth. But Elizabeth was a brilliant woman and also had a really interesting background. Uh, she was a Richmond native, but she was sent up to Philadelphia to be educated as a young girl. And while she was there, she came under care of an abolitionist governess. Um, and when she returned to Richmond, she brought those ideals back with her. She abhorred the institution of slavery. Um, and as soon as her father died, she defied his will by uh, freeing all of the family slaves. And she began spending her inheritance uh, buying slaves for the express purpose of freeing them. 
So she was really devoted to the cause. Um, and before the war, it was sort of, you know, people thought Elizabeth was this benign oddity. She was a strange woman. She was a spinster. She never married. She lived with her mother in this mansion in uh, Churchill, which was Richmond's most uh, prestigious neighborhood. They just thought she was this sort of qu quirky old lady and, and didn't give her much of a thought. Um, but after the war broke out, it was very dangerous for Elizabeth to be known as an abolitionist and for her to have such strongly held beliefs. Um, and it was uh, something that threatened her life on a daily basis. Uh, she was followed by Confederate detectives. She received death threats uh, constantly. Uh, but nevertheless, she went through with her plan to uh, operate a Union spy ring in the Confederate capital of Richmond. And she began recruiting people from all walks of life to do this. Um, and I think her greatest coup as a spy master um, had to do with Verena Davis. Uh, this is Verena Davis, the first lady of the Confederacy. Um, and late in 1861, Elizabeth heard that Verena Davis needed staff um, for, for the Confederate White House. Uh, she needed help for her family. And Elizabeth had an idea, and she paid Elizabeth, uh, Verena Davis a social call. And she said, I heard you, you were hiring help. You know, I have a girl for you. Um, she's not very bright, and she stumbles in the kitchen, but she's loyal, and she'll serve your family well. And she sends over a girl by the name of Mary Jane Bowser, a young woman by the name of Mary Jane Bowser. Now, Mary Jane Bowser had been born as a slave in the Van Loo family and was freed when she was about four years old. And Elizabeth took a special liking to her. Um, she considered uh, Mary Jane to be more of a daughter um, than, than a family employee and, and uh, really was close with her. Um, so she sends over Mary Jane Bowser. And little does anybody know uh, that Mary Jane Bowser is not only literate, but highly educated and gifted with a photographic memory. Um, so while she's dusting Jefferson Davis's desk and cleaning up the children's toys from the nursery, she's also uh, taking peeks at confidential papers on his desk and eavesdropping on his conversations and reporting all of this back to Elizabeth. Um, so a very important source for Elizabeth to have uh, in the Confederate White House and, and something that would get her in trouble later on. And I'm going to stop there uh, for, for the next, um, your next speaker. So, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, when I do book events and when I attend them, I don't like to hear authors read from their books because I think I can do that myself. So I'd like to hear why someone did a book, how they came to it, what they learned from doing it, and what other things that led them to. So in a nutshell, I've been writing a series of books about all of my childhood obsessions. And my first was Abraham Lincoln. He was born on Lincoln's birthday, as was mentioned. And my grandmother gave me an unusual gift when I was 10 years old not a baseball mitt or a bat or a bicycle. She gave me a framed engraving of John Wilkes Booth's Derringer pistol. <laughs> and framed with that engraving was part of a clipping from the Chicago Tribune from the morning of April 15, 1865, the morning that Lincoln died. And that clipping told the story of, it was John Wilkes Booth, the assassin, leaps to the stage, cries out, six semper tyrannis, vanishes into the wings, and and then someone had cut the clipping off in mid-sentence. <laughs> and that was my true Citizen Kane iconic totem or talisman. Because I said to myself, I have to read the rest of the story. I have to know what happened. I hung that on my bedroom wall, and I must have read it hundreds of times as a boy. It still is on my mantle today. Uh, later, when I was researching my book, Manhunt, I acquired a uh, collection of 200 original copies of the Chicago Tribune from the end of the Civil War and from the time of the Lincoln assassination. And I acquired the full issue of that very clipping that I had as a boy. And I also grew up in a family of storytellers. Uh, my grandparents lived with us. And my grandfather was on the Chicago police force from the Al Capone era to the anti-Vietnam and civil rights protest era. And my grandmother worked for the old Chicago tabloids, the very end of that Ben Hecht age. She worked for the Sun-Times, the Sun, the Times, the, the Daily News. And they would tell me the wildest stories when I was a boy. Uh, one time, uh, my grandmother said, Jamie, I was six at the time. Did you know that during the Chicago World's Fair of 1893, an insane doctor 
murdered a hundred girls and dissolved their bodies in vats of acid? And my mother said, well, he didn't know that until you told him. You know, he, he's six years old. Uh, another time my grandfather came home and said, don't let Jamie read the newspapers. And I'm sure that's what began my habit to this day of reading seven newspapers a day because I was warned not to. And of course, what's the first thing I did when I got home was read the newspapers. Do you remember Richard Speck, the murderer of the eight or nine student nurses with the knife? That was what I wasn't supposed to read. Uh, my father went to high school with Herbert Hans Haupt, one of the eight Nazi saboteurs landed on the shores of New Jersey. And later, uh, they were put on trial and they were put on trial in the room opposite my office at the Justice Department. And my father told me the teacher would say, in that desk sat Herbert Hans Haupt, the Nazi saboteur. So I grew up hearing lots of wild tales and, and really got interested in, in things that were happening now around us that, that we could learn about. And uh, when I decided to write Manhunt, my father said, well, thank goodness we didn't have you on Hitler's birthday. You would have been obsessed with him. And so uh, secondly, I was a collector before I was an author, an obsessive collector of hundred now thousands of books about Abraham Lincoln, the presidents, Civil War weaponry, blood relics, uh, a bloodied swatch of Laura Keene's dress stained with Lincoln's blood, a lock of Lincoln's hair uh, cut from his head by Secretary of War Stanton the morning he died. Uh, funeral relics, ribbons, autographs, uh, prints, photographs, oil paintings, sculptures. To me, objects are history. They have a magical power that can take us back in time in a way that words alone cannot. Some of my best friends have written, written wonderful books without ever really touching objects or the, the artifacts. I can't do that. One artifact can take me back in time. Um, the reason I wrote Manhunt is I had read all the books when I was a boy, and the Lincoln assassination is one of the least original topics in all of American historiography. There are over 16,000 books about Abraham Lincoln. If you want to pick a boring subject, pick Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> but I thought I wanted to write the story of the assassination in a way that I had never read. I really wrote the book that I had wanted to read. And unbelievably, no one thought of telling the story as a thriller or as a novel that happened to be true. A ticking clock, withholding information from the reader until it actually happens in history, and using other techniques of, of fiction, and also using the objects. For example, when I wrote a scene describing the room in which Lincoln died, I looked at my framed lock of Lincoln's hair, cut by Stanton, and it was framed with flowers that had adorned Lincoln's coffin at the White House funeral of April 19. So as I wrote that scene, I had this artifact in front of me. When I wrote the scene of Lincoln being shot in Ford's theater, and then the actress Laura Keene pushes her way into the box, uh, holds Lincoln head, Lincoln's head in her lap, as I wrote that scene, the scene really wrote itself in my book because I had in front of me one of the five known swatches of Laura Keene's dress stained with Abraham Lincoln's blood. And it really took me to that moment. And so for me, I, I must see objects or touch objects to be transported back to a scene. Uh, I won't really dwell much on what happened that night. We, we know it so well, John Wilkes Booth, uh, the famous celebrated actor, uh, the president's box, the pistol shot, the stabbing of Major Rathbone, the leap to the stage. I will say this. Uh, I think Booth was the first American assassin who performed the murder in a public way. He did it in a theater. It was really his second home away from home in Washington. He knew there'd be an audience of over 1,500 people. He knew that the best way to escape was to present himself to the audience. No one really saw Lincoln being shot by Booth. A couple people saw a flash in the box. They saw Booth go to the box. But it's not like the assassination of John F. Kennedy, where several hundred people saw the shooting. Very few saw the shooting of Lincoln. But everyone saw the man in the box leap to the stage. He could have shaved his mustache before he came on stage. 
He could have worn a disguise. He could have hidden his face. He could have run to the wings immediately. But instead, he stopped, thrust out his chest, lifted the bloody dagger in the air, and screamed, Six Semper Tyrannus, the, sou the, the state motto of Virginia, the Soist of Tyrants. And then he cried out, The South is avenged. And then he cried out my favorite thing that few people heard just as he was leaving the stage. Really, I think it was an exaltation to himself. I have done it. And then he vanished into the wings. And then when he's captured and then killed 12 days later at the Garrett Farm in Virginia, he performs his escape. During his escape, he, he adopts the guise of other people. He doesn't tell everyone who he is or what he's done. In fact, at one family home at the Garrett's the night before he was shot, he's discussing the motives of the killer, and the family is speculating. Who is Booth? What did he do? What did he do? Why did he do it? And then uh, one teenager said, I think he did it for money. And Booth, playing another role, said, do you think so, miss? I don't think he did it for money. I think he did it for fame. Or, or other reasons. And so uh, it was fascinating to see this final great act of the Civil War as really a fully staged performance where Brooke Booth really broke the fourth wall between the performer and the audience. Um, I really enjoy with these great stories and great characters, the side characters you meet, who tend to overshadow the main characters. And you can see the story through their eyes. Two of my favorites are Fanny Seward the daughter of Secretary of State Seward. He's almost stabbed to death in his bed. This frail teenage girl almost fights off the murderer, Lewis Powell. Another was uh, Lucinda Holloway, who was uh, at, at the uh, farm where Booth died, and she clipped a lock from his hair, and she wrote a, a very Christ-like description of him as a Southern hero, uh, spending his last few moments at the Garrett Barn. And uh, so through these diaries and stories by uh, many of these women characters, uh, I find that as interesting as telling the story through Lincoln's eyes or the story of great men. And it's great to, to bring these people back to the fore who, who have been forgotten. Also what's interesting to me is how one book or one set of characters can lead to something else. Uh, I thought Manhunt was my take on the Lincoln assassination. And then readers started to say, well, what happened next? And of course what happened next are two things the six-week manhunt for Jefferson Davis, and the great funeral journey that took Lincoln's corpse across the country. It was a slowly decaying, a 13-day railroad journey. And I decided that these two journeys were among the most interesting journeys in American history, as much as the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, the journey of Lewis and Clark. Uh, Lincoln became America's secular saint during the deathbed vigil at, at the Peterson House, and then during this journey. And I'm convinced it was this. In a war of 750,000 dead, what was one more casualty, even though it was the President of the United States? America hadn't been this sad, I think, since the death of George Washington in 1799. What was it about that funeral and that funeral train? And it's this, I think. Walt Whitman once said in, in his great poem, When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloom, and, and coffin that slowly passes, I give you my sprig of lilac. But that was not just for Lincoln. It was not only his coffin going home. I'm convinced that going home with Lincoln on that train, symbolically, were all the dead. Every father, every son, every brother, every husband, every lover lost in that war. And many of them were not, did not come home ever. They were never brought home for burial. They were all symbolically coming home with Father Abraham. And that's why I think the funeral journey and mourning for Lincoln, uh, which I touch on in Manhunt, but then devote a book to with, with in, in Bloody Crimes, is, is the most emotional event in American history since the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And if you want to know what people felt like after the murder of Lincoln, imagine how you felt after 9-11 and multiply those feelings. It was, it was a tremendous shock. I'll close with one thing that, that I hope I didn't do by writing this book, which is a woman approached me at a book signing, and she said, I'm mad at you, which caused me great alarm because when Lewis Powell, Booth's accomplice, was stabbing Secretary of Seward to death in his bed with a knife, he said calmly, I'm mad, I'm mad. So I looked at her hands to make sure she didn't have knives. And she said, you know why I'm mad at you? You made me love John Wilkes Booth. 
And I thought about that. And in Washington, D.C., we have banners saying, here's where we go to Ford's Theater. And I thought, something's wrong with that. Uh, it, it's not like the assassination of John F. Kennedy. We hate Oswald. We would never sell toy Oswald replica rifles at the Lincoln Library or at the, at the uh, JFK Library. Well, Ford's Theater, until I stopped it, was selling toy Derringer pistols. Somehow Booth has tricked us that it wasn't real. 150 years later, it's not as visceral. It, Booth is a tragic, flawed, antiquarian figure in many ways. His sister wrote a book that way saying that, that even now strangers come, high, come and pile his grave high with flowers. And I realized, of course, that Booth is not the hero of my story. Booth was a racist and a murderer. And I think he killed not only our greatest president, but the greatest American who ever lived. So I hope if you've read my book or you're going to read it, uh, though I want to put you in the saddle with Booth, have you empathize with him, feel what it was like to be a, a hunted, wanted man on the run. You never lose track of the fact that Lincoln is a hero. Uh, Manhunt is at the superficial level, a book about a murder and a chase, but at its fundamental level, and the book that, that I wrote for me, it's a longing tribute to Abraham Lincoln. So I hope uh, you'll agree with that. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Nonfiction Civil War stories is my favorite subject. In Morning Lincoln, I tell the story of personal responses to Lincoln's assassination. That's a story untold in all the many, many books about Lincoln and the assassination. And here's how the story begins. The play had already started when the Lincolns arrived. As the honored guests made their way up the stairway to the dress circle, the actors stopped and the audience cheered. As the band struck up Hail to the Chief, the president took an impromptu bow. It was Good Friday, April 14th, 1865. The presidential box hovered above stage left. Lincoln lowered himself into the walnut rocking chair with Mary seated to his right. At perhaps a quarter to 10, a quarter past 10, the audience roared with laughter. Then came a pistol crack. Was it part of the play? An accidental firing by a soldier in the audience? Now a man leapt to the stage. Was that part of the script? But he jumped from the president's box, waving a knife. Some heard him shout, sic semper tyrannis, thus always to tyrants. It didn't seem like a play anymore, and for a split second, everything froze. By the time the audience jolted from their seats, the gunmen had vanished. People rushed the stage, women fainted, soldiers rushed in with bayonets. Well, I've been teaching the Civil War for almost 25 years, but several years ago, I found myself taking a greater interest in Lincoln's assassination, and I now trace that interest to September 11th, 2001. That Tuesday was the first day of class, the first day of the fall semester at New York University. The first plane hit the towers before I left my apartment, and the second as I was walking to class. That experience made me think, about how people respond to transformative events on the scale of everyday life. That also made me think of the experience of Kennedy's assassination. I was five years old in 1963, so I have some memories of that. As a scholar of the Civil War, 9-11 made me wonder, what did people do at home, on the street, with their families, by themselves, when they heard the news of Lincoln's assassination. I wanted to understand a catastrophic event on a human scale. So in dozens of archives over five years, I read hundreds and hundreds of personal accounts of the spring and summer of 1865. I read Union and Confederate, black and white, soldiers and civilians, men and women, children too, the rich, the poor, the well-known, the unknown. 9-11 again. In the days that followed the attack on the Twin Towers, it felt like the whole world was grieving and in shock. And that was how I remembered it when I thought back when I was writing Morning Lincoln. Then, when I was writing this book, I dug out photographs I had taken on the morning of September 12, 2001, as I'd walked through the streets of Lower Manhattan. 
I took pictures of the makeshift memorials that mourners had created. And in those photos, I saw evidence of something else. I saw evidence of tension, evidence of contention. One sign called for peace, another for peace after payback. Messages calling for harmony were defaced with calls to war, in turn answered with cries for justice without revenge. Some signs spewed fury at the peacemakers, others warned mourners to distrust the media. Just so, reading those diaries and letters from the spring and summer of 1865, I did not find a nation united in mourning. Instead, I found the roots of the Civil War's long aftermath, the roots of irreconcilable visions of the nation's future when it came to black freedom and equality. And it was precisely that multivocal din of voices that interested me. Just as I expected, the most immediate act reaction among Lincoln's allies was shock. Astonished, astounded, startled, stupefied, thunderstruck, a calamity, a catastrophe, a dagger to the heart, a thunderbolt, a thunderclap from a clear blue sky. It was too horrible to be true and too terrible to believe. I cannot have it so, one woman wrote. It must not be so. It felt like a dreadful dream, people said, a horrible dream or a play on a stage, a lie or a joke, a sham or mere gossip, a nightmare or a show. That was how it felt, a deception, an illusion, a performance. The words people invoked to convey conveyed all manner of the unreal, Today, we might say, I felt like I was in a movie. Then, after the shock, came desolation. Very sad. Those two words conveyed the heavy sorrow that had mixed with the initial shock. In Baton Rouge, a Union Army chaplain found the hundreds of freed people all very sad. In Minnesota, the people all feel very sad, a soldier wrote in his diary. It was, Mary Emerson wrote from Paris, the saddest, saddest news we ever heard. Where it rained, people saw clouds weeping copiously. Where skies were blue, the very sunshine looked mournful. A former slave in Washington said that even the trees were weeping for Lincoln. Now, other kinds of responses made eminently clear that this end of war moment was far from a time of unity and closure. Across the defeated Confederacy, white Southerners reveled in the assassination. Just one example, a typical one, in South Carolina, a 17-year-old girl was in the middle of a German lesson when someone interrupted to break the news. Hurrah, she cheered, old Abe Lincoln has been assassinated. The lesson forgotten, she flew home, this is all from her diary, her heart beating with excitement. What do you think of the news, people shouted. Isn't it splendid? They were all in a tremor of excitement. Now, there were also white Northerners who despised Lincoln and, I discovered, celebrated his death. As a well-to-do woman wrote of her Irish immigrant cook, Julia was laughing all day. They hate Lincoln for emancipating the Negroes, fearing we shall employ them and reduce their wages. Nor, I found, did all Union soldiers love Lincoln. To the dismay of their comrades, some laughed and clapped when they heard the news. When word arrived among an Oregon regiment, for example, one of the men announced, I'm glad the old son of a bitch is dead. Meanwhile, Lincoln's mourners went to church on Easter Sunday, the day after he had died, and the crowds that day were unprecedented. Black churches and white churches jammed with worshipers, listening as their ministers tried to explain the assassination as part of God's divine plan for the nation's future. I cannot reconcile myself, one soldier admitted, stumped as to why the Almighty would take away the great Abraham Lincoln just at the moment of victory. I cannot believe it was for the best, he wrote. Then on Wednesday, April 19th, 1865, four days after Lincoln's death, Washington held its grand funeral. Mourners came to Washington by the thousands. They arrived on foot, on horseback, in carriages, and on special trains that the railroad companies added to their timetables. They filled every hotel and boarding house, slept in spare rooms and on floors and out of doors. They came looking to participate in rituals that would help them understand God's purposes and the meaning of Lincoln's death. 
They came to take part in the making of history. They expected to be overawed, and they wanted the victorious nation to move forward into a glorious future. The gravity was palpable. The well-orchestrated pomp and circumstance made it seem as if all the questions had been settled when none had been. Morning Lincoln connects these responses, shock, sorrow, glee, spiritual doubt, and many more, anger and fear, for example, connects those responses to these irreconcilable visions of the nation's future that I mentioned at the outset. Lincoln's mourners had right away blamed the assassination squarely on the institution of slavery. On the day Lincoln died, the accusations could be heard. All through private writings, Lincoln had been, people said, sacrificed to slavery, taken by an agent of that accursed system of slavery and states' rights, killed by all the hate, wickedness, and guilt of slavery. And yet I found the assassination did nothing to subdue the vanquished Confederates who claimed in their diaries and letters that they would, and here I'm quoting again, renew the struggle when the right moment comes, or to quote another, the South will rise again. In the face of this defiance, Lincoln's more radical mourners, both black and white, soon found their explanation for God's mysterious ways. God had taken Lincoln away, his more radical mourners now came to believe, in order to alert the victors to the enduring intransigence of their vanquished enemies. Now these mourners wanted land, education, and voting rights for African Americans. By ensuring the fruits of freedom, they wanted also to avenge the cause of the war, slavery, which they understood as well to be the root cause of the assassination. The assassination had opened the eyes of these radicals, both black and white, to the necessity for revolutionary policies following Confederate defeat on the battlefield because defeated Confederates who held political power could still win the war off the battlefield. At his second inauguration, only a few months before his death, Lincoln had called for, and these are his words, a just and a lasting peace. After the assassination, Frederick Douglass, the runaway slave and anti-slavery activist, echoed those words, telling his fellow mourners that permanent peace, those were Douglass's words, could not be accomplished without justice. What resonance. Today we say no justice, no peace. Lincoln and Douglass knew that. Now, to close, we cannot know what would have come to pass had Lincoln lived. We do know that the slain president's martyrdom permitted African Americans and their white allies to invoke Lincoln's name in the quest for equality. Morning Lincoln brings to life the conflicts of the hours, days, and weeks after the assassination to illuminate a historical moment too often glossed over as a time of national mourning. Instead, those hours, days, and weeks were a time of intense strife that's been left out of the story. I'm going to read one final passage which resonates with what James Swanson said about objects. I'm going to read you a brief passage about how Lincoln's mourners preserved the experience of living through the assassination. As the victors turned mourners forged ahead, they also looked back, collecting Lincoln memorabilia from the first instant. By gathering and preserving relics, the bereaved sought confirmation of the cataclysmic event, wrote themselves into the history they had witnessed, and enshrined the past for the future. Images of the president were the most ubiquitous, ranging from 20-cent postcards to custom-ordered engravings. People also collected copies of funeral sermons, memorial books that gathered together the Emancipation Proclamation, the Gettysburg Address, and the Second Inaugural. Artifacts also felt precious, and collection began on the night of April 14th at Ford's Theater. A man who encountered the crowds on 10th Street made his way into the playhouse while everyone else was exiting, climbed up to the presidential box, and pocketed Lincoln's discarded bloody collar. Peterson's boarding house across the street from the theater, where Lincoln had been carried and where he had died, was open for business that spring. A visitor went there, peering into the very room, taking in the sight of the blood-soaked pillow more than six weeks after this had happened. Left just as it was on that night, she wrote to a friend, heartbreaking as it felt, there were two reasons she wanted to survey the frozen scene. 
First, it was, she wrote, an historical fact. Second, it made everything that now still seemed so unbelievable, so vivid. Thank you. I have nothing to add. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, I have a couple of minutes, I guess. So, um, I just, you know, I wrote a book called Custer's Trials, A Life on the Frontier of a New America. And as I point out at the begin beginning of the book, Custer's story starts with its ending. That like John Hancock's signature, it's the one thing everybody knows about the man, that he was at the end of his life, on the last day of his life, alone on a hilltop, uh, realizing that after 36 years of incredible good luck, his luck had run out. And that's what we know about him. The question is, for me, why did people care other than the fact that it was a great military defeat at the hands of pre-industrial nomadic peoples, a big enough event as it is? The answer is that he was a, both a national celebrity and also incredibly divisive during his lifetime, that he stood for larger things, and there was something internal that propelled him there. So we talk about Civil War stories. As Custer himself spent his life telling stories about himself. He had an idea of himself that he not only wanted other people to believe, but he wanted to believe himself. And that is one of the elements in him that makes him so volatile and so dramatic, is this uh, constant attempt to be something that he inwardly suspected that perhaps he wasn't. Now, one version of this story we know very well. It's Custer arriving at the Gettysburg battlefield, wearing this elaborate costume, which he had suddenly appeared upon him the day, the day after he was promoted to Brigadier General at the age of 23 black velvet with gold braid winding up the sleeves from cuff to elbow, a blue sailor shirt tufted out over the back, a red tie. Uh, a general's uniform in the Civil War was double-breasted as opposed to single-breasted for a junior officer. Now, they, there was no um, uh, store, just velvet uniforms. So obviously he had this thing in his trunk as a 23-year-old uh, uh, lieutenant waiting for the day when he became a general. And he rides off to Gettysburg and he plays a dramatic role and actually helps to win the battle, plays a very key role. Not only that, he plays a very romantic role. The Civil War, as has been mentioned, 750,000 people died. This is a war that gives rise to perhaps not a generation, but a cohort of intellectuals who are disillusioned, realistic, even cynical. The, a new sense of irony begins to enter into American intellectual culture. So we have Ambrose Bierce, the darkest of the dark. We have um, Mark Twain, ironic, wry. Um, we have Henry Adams and his brother, Charles Francis Adams, Jr. Um, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. Very realistic, very dark um, minds who had come through the Civil War, uh, experiencing it at its worst, seeing good men, brave men dying randomly. Custer, though, fought on the edges of these great infantry battles for the most part fighting cavalry against cavalry, in which personal skill and valor actually still mattered. He may be the last American general to have killed another man in a sword fight. So this is the romantic image of Custer that he consciously tried to project, and yet it had a reality behind it, which is why it took hold, which is why he became a celebrity in the first place. But there are other stories about Custer that tell us something about the way America was changing. And there are other stories that surrounded him as well. So we look at within Custer, this r dramatic rise is not just simply a matter of luck or of merit. This is also a man working the chains of patronage, trying to find someone, a higher up who will be his patron, creating his own patronage networks, that kind of very individual and personal America that existed before the rise of the organizational society. And Custer is adroitly playing that role while he is in the archetype of the new organizational society, the army. So he is, again, kind of a contradictory figure, very much of his times, but not of the times that are beginning to emerge. This is a man who was um, very much deeply embroiled in politics. When we read his letters about the 1860 election, we see him using the language of secessionist fire eaters. During the Civil War, though, he has to cultivate support on Capitol Hill, and so he writes outlandish, almost a parody 
outlandish versions, almost a parody of radical Republican views, so that he can convince Republican senators to confirm his appointment. We see his wife, who he marries, is this well-educated, intelligent woman, functioning as his personal liaison to Capitol Hill. And then after the Civil War is over, telling him, you will not go into politics. I know these guys. Politics is a game for professionals. But Custer couldn't help himself. As soon as the war was over, he plunged into national politics and campaigned along um, President Andrew Johnson against Reconstruction, against the 14th Amendment, against the first Civil Rights Act, very much a man who was opposed to this new and ultimately truncated revolution in civil rights, even though he had played a key role in destroying slavery, even though he'd played a key role in preserving the Union and defending the defeating the Confederacy. There are other stories that surround him as well that I tried to bring to the foreground. One, of course, is the story of his wife, Libby Custer, intelligent, charming, beautiful. She uh, resented the constraints placed upon women, but she was too much of a respectable middle class woman to, to actually openly oppose those restrictions. And so she marries this um, incredibly charismatic man, this, this rising young star in the Civil War. She goes off to, after it's quite a tumultuous uh, um, and dramatic courtship, she goes to the front with him during the winter when the fighting is at a lull. And what does she find? A young black woman who's actually in charge of the household. And Custer in, and Libby Custer in their personal lives, in their personal relationships, confront emancipation and its aftermath, this new change in civil and in uh, racial relations within their own household. A young woman named Eliza Brown, who as a teenager escaped from slavery, made her way to Union Army lines, and was hired by Custer to be his cook. And she adroitly took advantage of that position to create authority for herself. She used her position in the general's mess to build a patronage network of her own to other contrabands distributing food. She uses her position to trade information. She cultivates every single courier who shows up from headquarters. She always has a plate of baked treats ready for them and gets, pumps them for information. And then when Libby Custer shows up, Libby Custer is a threat to this authority, but she is too adroit in, in those personal relationships across the racial barrier, whereas Libby Custer isn't. This is before the Great Migration, Almost all African Americans are living in the South, and the primary survival adaptation that Eliza Brown has is how to deal with white people who have the power to kill her with no legal consequences. And so she takes Libby Custer, and as Libby later wrote, she practiced, practiced the most adroit diplomacy as the, the most intelligent and well-educated person could, could ever carry out. And so she keeps Libby as an ally while keeping her out of the household affairs and gradually Libby realizes she's being outmaneuvered by this woman that society has taught her is her inferior. And so they develop this fascinating relationship, allies in a very male environment, allies in a very foreign environment when they go out to the Great Plains, and yet also with this rising tension that's related to race, that's related to two women struggling for a very limited amount of power that's available to them. And so Custer's story is when I was writing this, I was thinking about um, uh, a, a book that I love, James McBride's um, The Good Lord Bird, in which he takes people who are in the most, historically, the most heightened ideological moment. John Brown's, you know, uh, campaign crusade in Kansas and his, his uh, foray to um, Harper's Ferry. And he takes a, a, a young um, black man, is it really a child, uh, named Onion in the story, and Onion is just trying to survive. He's not heroic. He's not an archetype. He's trying to survive. And you know the people who are the most ideological, like John Brown, there's something both heroic about him in that fictional depiction and also something very human, somewhat ridiculous, incredibly charismatic, even though you can see how ridiculous it can be. This, this kind of sensitivity to the way that real human beings are, even in heightened circumstances. That's what I was thought about, thought about when I was writing about these three people, living out all the changes, taking part on a public stage as well as in the privacy of their own household, of all these changes. They believe in things, and yet they're also human beings who are struggling in those little adjustments for power and to adjust their relationships in those daily negotiations. So Custer's Civil War story is a story that his personal experience speaks to the public 
a nation that's exhausted by war, that's sick of all this death. And here they see the kind of romantic hero they envisioned in 1861. But the rest of Custer's story is about how these seeds of, of self-promotion, of self-absorption, of um, a love of, of some of the worst aspects of American history, of, of warfare, of a deep-seated ideological commitment to white supremacy. We see a man who takes a, a moment of incredible celebrity, probably the only division commander who was a household name at the end of the Civil War, and he almost immediately becomes a divisive figure, throwing himself into public affairs. And the rest of my book goes on to follow through those consequences as he, he, he fails to adapt to a country that, that is changing and that he's trying to engage with, trying to make a fortune on Wall Street, trying to become a kind of public intellectual, writing about his, his experiences in the West. Um, as a man who was uh, not only defending the um, uh, transcontinental railroad in the field, but also in print. The transcontinental railroad, by the way, that goes on to cause the panic of 1873 and America's longest depression till the Great Depression. So this is somebody who is in the mix, completely in the middle of great public affairs. And yet, just as he does now, he symbolizes to Americans their divided views over what their country represents and over the future that the country will um, take. So thank you very much. And I'm not sure, do we have time for questions? We have a few moments for some questions. So there is a microphone just in the center of the room here. Please feel free to come on up. Yes, sir. I'd like to ask Ms. Abbott if she could point to a specific example of any military consequence of any of the spying and, uh, of, of her four protagonists. And I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Swansea uh, if he's uh, his comment on the manifesto that uh, John Wilkes Booth, I believe, uh, uh, wrote to explain uh, why uh, he uh, conspired for the uh, assassination. things across the lines. Um, and I think it's probably safe to say that the North would not have won the war without uh, Elizabeth Stanlow. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant even sent a note to her, you know, said he, he did provide me some of the most valuable intelligence that I received during the war. Um, so, so I will <laughs> put a vote in for Elizabeth Stanlow on that front. With respect to uh, Booth's manifesto, you're referring, of course, to the multi-page manuscript that was uh, in the longtime possession of uh, in Gramercy Park at the Players Club in the library there. And unfortunately, in a great desecration, the Players Club auctioned off that Booth manuscript about five years ago. Well, it, it, it's an interesting document, uh, and it pertains to one of Booth's three motives. He killed Abraham Lincoln, in my opinion, for three reasons. Number one, he despised Lincoln. He viewed him as a great usurper, a great tyrant, who trampled on the rights of the South and of Northerners. and, and uh, Lincoln betrayed the principles of the founding, according to Booth's idea. And so partly, Lincoln had to be punished. It was vengeance. Number two in the motives was he hoped to prompt the South to somehow rise again or not agree to the end of the war. Uh, he shows that by targeting Secretary of State Seward for murder. Vice President Andrew Johnson was targeting for murder. Booth wanted there to be some kind of civil, what do you call it, civil, whether it's civil rest, uprising. He wanted more from the South, and he hoped that would inspire them. And ultimately, and not to be diminished is the other motive, as he told his teenage sister when he was a, a, a boy, fame, I must have fame. And he got it. We remember him to this day. Uh, so the manifesto is an important thing, his political motives, but 
there were three. Yes. Uh, this is great. Uh, I just wonder, I've never thought about this before uh, this last hour, but what if Lincoln had lived? Do you ever think about what our past is? Well, <laughs> that's a question I get quite frequently, and I actually tried to head it off in my talk, which I always try to do by saying we cannot know what would have happened. Um, we do know one thing, though. Vice President Andrew Johnson, who succeeded Lincoln, was consistently voted one of the worst presidents in American history. And although he despised elite white Southerners and therefore the vanquished Confederates feared him and thought of Lincoln as more moderate, in fact, Johnson hated African Americans more than he hated elite white Southerners. And so it was his policies that um, really favored the vanquished Confederates and that, of course, brought on radical reconstruction, which, of course, had its own counter-reaction in the era of Jim Crow lynching and, uh, in a way, the replication of slavery. So had Lincoln lived, we don't know what would have happened, but he would have done much, much better than Andrew Johnson. You know, that's an interesting question that, um, I mean, there's no question that Lincoln would have acted very differently from Johnson. Um, and he had already called for, in his last speech, limited enfranchisement of African Americans. And I think he would have gone further, but it, there's always the possibility that, that we achieved such at least legal um, results out of the Civil War with the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, the Civil Rights Act, the Enforcement Acts, you know, really creating a, a legal definition of non-racial citizenship. As you could argue that it was a response, a result of almost like a Hegelian dialectic as Johnson uh, encouraged, with his support, Southern uh, whites lash out so violently that it caused people who were actually quite racist in the North to say, we have to enfranchise African Americans to be able to keep the South loyal and keep it in the Union. So you could actually argue that we, we might have actually gone farther, at least in law, if not in final results, because Lincoln died. Though I, I wouldn't make that argument, but I'd say it's, well, it's, TJ, it's one possibility. I, I, think, I think you're right to an extent, because if Lincoln had lived, he wouldn't have been America's secular saint. He wouldn't have been our martyr. Would we have done to Lincoln what the British did to Winston Churchill in the fall of 1945? Churchill saved England from Nazi invasion, and the people of the ungrateful people of England threw him out of office. So would Lincoln have had a tougher time if he had lived? I agree with you. Just as the assassination of Kennedy made it easier for Lyndon Johnson to pass vital civil rights legislation, I think the assassination of Lincoln made it easier to pass amendments and other things in the aftermath. It would have been better if Lincoln had lived, but there's always the possibility we might have Churchilled Lincoln if he had lived. Yeah, sure. Though also, people fewer people would have died in the South. Fewer African Americans would have died in the atrocities had Lincoln been president, because he would have clamped down really fast on that. And ultimately, he was enigmatic, and we cannot know. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, they had a really interesting relationship. I mean, they both really loved the attention of the opposite sex. And I think this part of this is the fact that the underside of Custer's flamboyance, I see a, a, a deep insecurity also. Someone from a very poor, obscure background wanted to be considered great. He's telling the story about himself. He craves attention and this reinforcement. And, you know, he was, a, he was quote, a ladies' man, according to his roommate. And so, uh, you know, it's very likely that he had affairs. And yet he also had an intense, intimate, and very emotionally connected relationship with his wife. I think it's why they stayed together through all of the, the craziness that he put her through. And she occasionally did it to him and, and taunted him with the attention of men, you know, raising their value in each other's eyes by saying, you know, these people think I'm great. Um, so yeah, there was a really, especially in, in New York in 1866, she was tending to her dying father in Monroe, Michigan. And he's at parties with and writing about how women are coming on to him, and it's, it's pretty awesome. And uh, so that's the kind of self-absorbed, needy side of Custer that is also leads to, I think, other you know, consequences, because he keeps 
kept creating disasters for himself. And even though we remember him as being a bad general because of the way he died, he actually kept getting out of these disasters by his ability to fight well. And so, you know, again and again, personally and professionally, this kind of neediness and insecurity leads him to and just the inability to deal with the new world. So his relationship leads to these disasters. And that happens in his marriage, too. They're like they come to crisis after crisis, but they come back. Okay. And with that, thank you so much to all of our, our authors. <laughs> and thank you all for joining us. The autographing area is right outside of these double doors to your right at the second.